Ah, uh, there's Crook. <laughs> Can you hear me? Or... All right. Hey, what are you up, Randy? Mr. Crook, test your microphone. Not working. He, you know what? He was just talking a minute ago. We could hear him. Randy, that's the exact same problem we were having in the breakout room. It was kind of fading in and then fading out, and it didn't really relate to what he was doing on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> we thought that logging him back out, uh, logging him back out and come back in might help, but it doesn't seem to. Have. Adam, how's your, can you do an AV check real quick? How's this? I, this, this thing keeps, I just got kicked out of the room. I don't know why. Well, you're in the right room now. You were transported no, I was, my, involuntarily. My voice was, my screen wasn't. Well, welcome to the other side. Yeah. <laughs> it had some report I was supposed to read. And I said, oh, crap, I didn't see that in time. <laughs> okay, are we in the metaverse now? We are. We are in the metaverse with, uh, it looks like, um, I'm looking for Suzanne. There she is. Suzanne, is that you? National Water Research? Yeah. There she is. Okay. Hello. How are we doing um, roster wise? Looks like we've got everybody we expected. I'm going through my list. There's Chuck Gerba. Chuck, you there? We didn't see you in the breakout room, but welcome. Yeah, physically, but not mentally. He's got a sign. <laughs> okay. So, Suzanne, are we good? Yes. Everyone that we are expecting from the panel is in attendance. And who's running the slides today? Jing Chow. Okay. Well, Jing, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Why don't you go ahead and advance the slide? We'll uh, we'll get going here with meeting number four. And I want to welcome everyone uh, to the State Water Water Resources Control Board, DDW, expert panel for the review of the draft regulations for direct potable reuse. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kevin Hardy, the Executive Director of the National Water Research Institute, which is based in Fountain Valley, California. Next slide. Uh, as we know, we've talked about this many times, but we're so proud of the work we do. We're the nation's collaborative resource for the advancement of science, policy, and innovation in the water realm. We're the independent expert advisory services provider of choice for the most challenging water and quality water resource management and related innovation issues. And we hope to provide insight and understanding of current and future issues in water science and technologies in all our work. Next slide. Here's our panel. Uh, our co-chairs, Mr. Crook and Olivieri, uh, Dick Bill, Jorg Drevis, Chuck Gerba, Chuck Haas, Amy Pruden, Joan Rose, Shane Snyder, Jackie Taylor, George Shabanagloss, and Mike Weiner. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for your, for your support of this process. I really appreciate the, all the work that has gotten us to this point, and I'm excited about uh, today's agenda. Next slide. We have a few objectives for today. Uh, first, we want to provide an update on the status of the expert panel's review. Uh, of the early draft anticipated criteria. We wanna consider some presentations from uh, the DDW staff on key issues that have been identified uh, previously by the expert panel. And then we wanna provide an opportunity for public comment related to the early draft of the anticipated criteria. Next slide. Here's our agenda. Uh, we've got an hour together, so we'll try to get through this in five minutes and then we'll get to a, a report out by Adam and Jim. Uh, then we'll move into the DDW staff presentations, and hopefully we can uh, be ready to move to public comment at 11:45. Uh, the rules. Oh, there you go. Now, let's go. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, the meeting ground rules, as usual. Appreciate everyone's patience. Do keep yourself muted, both audio and video, uh, unless you're speaking. It really does help the bandwidth and the and the flow of communication during the meeting. So we appreciate that. Uh, you do have uh, internet or phone audio on Zoom. But if you use the phone, uh, make sure you enter your name so we can see who's speaking. And I haven't heard the noise, the sound yet, but this meeting is being recorded. Did I miss that? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, uh, next slide. Okay, so here are the rules uh, for anyone who's interested to speak during the public comment session. They're fairly simple, but it's important to send this email to the DDW staff to request a special link that allow you to make your comment. That email is ddwrecycledwater at waterboards.ca.gov. 
in the subject line of that email, important to write DPR Recording criteria. in progress. Expert panel meeting number four. And in the body of the email, provide the following, your name, who you represent, whether it's yourself, another person at one organization, whether you're attending by video conference or telephone. And for if you're going to come in by phone, again, that same concept, you need to be able to identify you. So if you can give us the last three digits of your phone number that you intend to call from, that'll help us identify you when you call. So um, these are the rules. We'll go back over the public comment session rules uh, right before. So if you miss them uh, or can't finish them before we get off, uh, uh, worry not. We'll get back to you. But make sure you get that email to DDW Recycled Water at waterboards.ca.gov. Okay, next slide. Okay, before we turn over the DPR criteria, the expert panel co-chairs, and I appreciate all the work they've done. I did want to say, I, I did want to take just a minute to welcome and, and say thank you for showing up today. Uh, you know, the, it, just as we were starting to break out from COVID, it seems like uh, we've been handed another challenge to kind of to kind of take our attention away from this important work that we're doing. And, um, you know, it's hard not to feel like sometimes there are really important things in the world that require our attention, and they do. And cause we, because we know what happens when we don't pay attention to things like what are going on in Europe right now. So uh, I know that everybody's concerned about those uh, events. I know that uh, everybody is committed to doing what they can to bring peace to the world. I want everybody to know that I appreciate your effort to be here and that I appreciate the work we're doing as an example of people coming together from a lot of different backgrounds and cultures and getting important work done for the public. Uh, and I wanna say thank you for uh, not only for your efforts, but supporting me and my efforts to do that. So, so thank you very much. And with that short and hopefully uh, uh, brief enough admonition and, and thank, I'll turn it over to Adam Olivieri, uh, the co-chair of your panel. Adam, take it away. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I think evening for Jord. Uh, and thank you for participating. I agree with Kevin. Um, and to get started, Jing, can you, are you doing slides? Okay. Uh, today's presentation is going to be a compilation of the first three meetings plus uh, what the panel has worked on since meeting three to prepare for this particular meeting and, and discussing a finding. Uh, next slide. I'd very much like to thank the and appreciate the, uh, the collaborative nature of the work with the DDW staff, uh, as well as the panel. And I think without that collaboration and cooperation and including the NWI staff, we would not have been able to get this done in the time frame laid out, nor be as productive as we have been. Um, the panel does clearly understand the charge. Every once in a while that comes up, but we do understand the charge clearly. And the panel's review, which you'll see shortly, is, is based on the draft August 17th, 2021 version. Next slide. Uh, while the focus of the review is to determine if the proposed regulation provides adequate protection of public health relative to the risk posed by water being produced, there is a significant concern about unintended consequences, particularly related to excessive energy consumption <coughs> and a carbon footprint. And it's pretty clear if you look back over, over time within California that certain goals and executive orders have been signed to deal with that question of energy consumption and a carbon footprint. Uh, a responsive, sustainable, and cost-effective approach to developing these regulations includes recognition by the state board for potentially over-engineering treatment barriers and requires an intentional effort by DDW to develop a reasonable number and combination of such barriers. The panel recommends that the state board address the above concerns through a holistic risk analysis. And the panel looks forward to reviewing that analysis as part of the review of the final draft criteria. Next slide. The panel's preliminary finding. We'll start with findings and then we'll move into recommendations and comments on, on various particular sections of the criteria. The draft DPR regulation adequately protects public health. And that's the August, 2021 draft. The panel's preliminary finding assumes that the state board will fully consider and address the panel's comments and recommendations when developing a revised draft. And it's our expectation that the revised draft will be shared with the panel for final review before consider, considering adoption. And, and this is consistent with how the, pan, the previous panel worked with the surface water augmentation regulations. Next slide. 
panel agrees with DDW's intent, and particularly on the RWA criteria, the panel agrees with DDW's intent to keep criteria broad enough to cover all forms of DPR. However, the panel recommends that clearly acknowledging raw water augmentation in the criteria or statement of reasons is appropriate and necessary. For example, it's inserting clear acknowledgement on how the draft criteria would apply to an RWA project relying on a small reservoir that is smaller than the SWA criteria allow with an existing surface water treatment plant is necessary. Next slide. Under the chemical control criteria, you heard many of these at meeting number three, but for completeness, we're covering them here. Uh, the panel recommends that ozone and biological activated carbon processes be located appropriately before the RO process to manage low molecular weight compounds as well as other CECs. Recommends using car <laughs> carbamazepine, I can never pronounce these, and sulfamethyloxalol as an ozone performance indicator and recommends using acetone and formaldehyde as a BAC performance indicator. Next slide. Uh, Panel recommends deleting the applied ozone total and total organic carbon dosage language and include a requirement directly in the criteria and include a requirement to develop a project specific dosage as part of the engineering report clause. Panel recommends online nitrite monitoring for ozone feed water and alternatives relating to ozone BAC should be addressed as part of the alternatives clause. Next slide. Under the engineering report criteria section, uh, the panel recommends including a requirement to define a chemical peak as part of the monitoring plant operation plans, including defining an action. You, and we suggest using the DPR report as a guidance document, which can be referenced in the statement of reasons. Include a requirement to address optimizing secondary treatment process. This is extremely important. Criteria need to result in produ producing stable and high quality, fully nitrified water prior to introduction into the advanced water treatment facility. Include a reference to the technical managerial and financial capacity documents that DWU will use to review and approve TMS plans could be part of the statement of reasons. This, I'm repeating it here in the engineering report criteria. We'll also discuss it separately later. Next slide. Include a requirement to address other plant operation performance issues such as changing wastewater characteristics, both during initial design and long-term, climate change, influent flow and load equalization, wastewater treatment plant optimization to reduce energy and chemical use, equalization and treatment and return flows, temperature effects on treatment and distribution system chemistry. Next slide. Include a requirement to develop project-specific O3 Ozone TOC dosage as part of the engineering report clause. This is a repeat, include a requirement to assess project cybersecurity plans or develop a plan. Next slide. Under monitoring disease surveillance programs or and community raw wastewater surveillance programs, while the panel agrees that the community raw wastewater surveillance monitoring locate disease outbreak within a, within a served community may be practical as an early indicator of outbreaks, but it is not practical and or feasible approach for assessing adequacy of water treatment. The panel does not recommend that wastewater surveillance monitoring be a requirement within the DPR criteria. Next slide. Online wastewater collection system monitoring recommendations. The concept is interesting and the panel applauds DDW's forward thinking on the topic. However, the technology to effect effectively develop and implement such a program is not currently feasible and or practicable in the panel's opinion. The panel recommends that DDW include criteria that encourage direct potable reuse responsible agencies to continue to investigate future development and application of this concept through pilot programs. And the panel notes that DDW and or the California Water Boards can update regulatory permits to include online collection system monitoring as such programs become feas feasible and practicable. Next slide. Under pathogen control, um, the panel spent quite a bit of time reviewing this criteria and uh, the observations are uh, a number of conservative assumptions were used by the staff to develop their log reduction values. Selecting a daily risk goal versus an annual risk goal, selecting a single virus, norovirus, to represent human virus, 
selecting a concentration of a single maximum point versus use of a distribution. An assumed ratio between gene copies and infectious units is always one-to-one. -one. Selected conservative dose response functions where others were available. Uh, selected volume of drinking water consumed as a single daily value versus a distribution and selected representative LRVs based on a maximum point estimate versus a statistical characterization from an LRV distribution. Next slide. As an example, and there'll be more documentation of what, what you'll see here today in the panel's memo, as well as several different PowerPoint slides uh, that, that illustrate uh, the impacts of some of these conservative assumptions. But just, just an example for today, the panel looked at a seven order of magnitude uh, range based on two assumptions, um, the GI to infectious unit, assuming one-to-one -one, and use of the hypermetric, one of the dose response distributions. And this is, whoops, we lost everything. We need to reshare the screen one moment. Jing, you should be able to share your screen again. I can go from memory, so. <laughs> there was, there's a pop-up window that's interfering, so we're just gonna reshare it. The suspense. <laughs> Should I keep going for my memory or? <laughs> no, I think this is a really important slide. I think, uh, I think we Hang, want to go back and to... have that up. It seems Hang, are you able least... to share your screen? You're muted. Yeah, I'm trying to bring it back up. Okay, great. Sorry about this. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, no, yeah, no worries. No, yeah, no problem, Jane. Here we go. Okay. So. You're back. Good, thanks. I think one slide back, Jim. Correct. Yeah. There it is. All right, Thank I'll do this Jay. one. Yeah, no, no, no stress there. Well done, Jay. Good yeah. job. Thanks. Um, let me just start over on this one. This slide here just illustrates a couple of the variables of the 10 or so that I mentioned. Um, just to show this either a seven or a 10 order of magnitude range, depending on what assumptions you're selecting and, and how you select. Um, the orange illustrating point estimates for G, uh, gene copy and infectious units, one to one or 10,000 to one. And, and I'm not saying 10,000 to one is, is, is the correct value. Um, it, we're just using it for illustra illustrative purposes. And the blue showing using a distribution of values, in particular the DPR2 data set versus picking a point estimate. And, and one can see a, a significant range uh, pops up when those, depending on what assumption to use uh, to, to develop the log reduction associated with either with a daily and, and, in, and in other cases, the annual risk goal. Next slide. And so in conclusion on this, uh, DDW erred on the side of caution. And we don't disagree with that, but they erred on the side of caution. However, compounding numerous, numerous conservative assumptions may result in unrealistic and impracticable results. While the current DDW criteria can be considered protective of public health, additional analysis is recommended to address potential over-engineering of treatment barriers and to conduct an intentional effort by DDW to require a reasonable number and combination of such barriers. The panel recommends a probabilistic analysis using the TPR2 data set rather than the static maximum point approach for development of LRVs. Next slide. Uh, the panel also, I mean, we, we followed DDW's lead on sort of the approach of looking at combining time to response 
But we suggest an alternative approach, which relies on LRVs, which simplifies sort of the understanding and possibly the writing of permits in terms of compliance with these, with LRVs and, and not adding a more complex time of response. Although we do, we do understand why time of response is, is absolutely important. Next slide. In summary, uh, if you evaluate what the panel came up with and the documentation for these for this information will be in the memo. On the left side is what's shown in the, what's contained in the August draft, 2014-15 uh, at the upper end and a 16-10-11 uh, at the lower end, not including uh, failures, failure assumptions. And on the right side, is the panel's suggested uh, LRVs based on their analysis of 131010, uh, not including uh, assumptions regarding failure, and then adding in a six log or a five log redundancy, ending up with an 181515. Now, time to response is included on, on the left side and on the right side, as we'll discuss in a second, we're we're looking at compliance with a certain LRV, say the 18, for 18 15, 15, 90% of the time, acceptable operation, 9% of the time, 15, 12, 12, and 1% of the time, acceptable operation in the 13, 10, 10 range. And below that, we totally agree with EDW is continuing, uh, discontinuing delivery. Uh, next slide. In summary, the, the, the minimum basis again is 13, 10, 10. Uh, the minimum redundancy needed to address undetected failures is plus five logs. And that is based on a six log failure rate for a 24 hour period or and a 1% compliance with, uh, above the baseline. Um, that gets us 99% compliance with the daily risk goal and greater than 99% compliance with the annual risk goal. In, modeling in less than once in 100 years. Next slide. Oh, actually, back up one slide. Uh, the 90%, 9%, 1% was, was a suggestion by the panel. In the documentation we'll provide, we looked at a couple of other alternatives. We also looked at a couple of other alternatives for four log redundancy. Uh, and we leave it to DDW to kind of look at that and evaluate it. And we're more than willing to discuss it further. Uh, after we're done with this review. Um, next slide. Uh, the panel suggests, and here it is, an alternate approach to address compliance with log reduction that greatly simplifies the response time-based approach currently proposed. And the panel's probabilistic analysis identified LRVs that adequately protect public health and are based on scientifically defensible assumptions. Next slide. Panel recommends clarifying, and this is moving on here, clarifying how alternative LRVs are addressed within the criteria such that there is no need to expand the alternative clause to cover pathogen controls. One of our first comments was to extend, extend the alternative clause to cover LRVs. Uh, however, uh, DDW staff indicated there was no need to, and we're just looking for the clarification as to why there is no need to. And one example is, is how LRV redundancy could be addressed for an RWA project. Options to address this could include clarifying the text and the criteria, expanding the alternatives clause, and or including detailed clarification in the statement of reasons. Next slide. Moving on to communications and notification, this, the, the panel agrees with uh, making those notifications consistent with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, and the panel also agrees with developing a program of close communication and coordination with local and state public health agencies, as well as major hospitals within the DIPRA service area is an important element of the draft criteria. Next slide. Under technical, managerial, and financial capability, the, the criteria appropriately required development of T TMF plan, the panel recommends the DDW include the following criteria or in the statement of reasons, information and examples on what is expected to be included in TMF documentation, we understand that exists, and information identifying the key factors DDW staff will use to review the plan and determine acceptability. The panel still recommends utilizing an independent third party to review uh, portions of the TMF plan. Next slide. Uh, this is an important element that the panel you know, discussed 
pretty much in depth. The panel recommends that DPR criteria include a third party peer review requirement to review designs, including instrumentation controls and the status system before project preparation of bid documents, review, review a project at commissioning and review of operational projects to identify engineering best practices that can be incorporated into future engineering designs. These reviews, because they lead to improved practices, will also inherently benefit public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, this information is consistent with the National Society of Professional Engineers. Next slide. Other items. Uh, the panel recommends including a criterion that requires 24-7 operation for at least 12 months before considering a request for reducing the number of operators and or unstaffed operations include a clear linkage in the DPR criteria and monitoring or source control and or the statement of reasons to the state board recycle policy for chemicals of emerging concern relative constituents to be monitored, monitoring trigger levels and response action plan. Um, the criteria include a TOC monitoring and the criteria currently include TOC monitoring in several locations. While the panel agrees with that, the use of the 0.5 milligram per liter TOC as written could imply that TOC is a health-based criteria. The criterion statement of reasons should clarify that TOC is not a health-based criteria. Next slide. Criteria should include specific timeframes and digital formats for submitted monitoring data to the state board DDW include a 20 year life cycle planning horizon for the DIPRA joint plan and a limited life cycle cost analysis update every five years. And the panel agrees with DDW staff criteria that the existing drinking water treatment processes that have been validated for LRVs and approved by DDW do not need to be revalidated. Next slide. In fine, I think we're getting there. The enhanced source control section, uh, we suggest you redefine the wastewater source control criteria section as the enhanced wastewater source control criteria. We also recommend that the source control section delete the requirement for quantitative risk assessment as it's confusing and probably not productive for each uh, utility to conduct and duplicative of the state board efforts um, on CECs. And the panel suggests a specific reference be added to the statement of reasons regarding enhanced source control QRA background information uh, to the state board risk-based documents to eliminate confusion with other risk assessment approaches. Next slide. And finally, uh, February 28th is today. That's our report out and panel preliminary panel finding and recommendations. By mid-March, we expect to have a draft memo documenting the various PowerPoint presentations and analysis and the findings and recommendations pulled together um, and delivered to DDW for review. And then a couple week turnaround time for review and hopefully finalize the memo uh, the end of March or very first part of April. Any additional work is left uh, to be determined at this point. And I, again, I'd like to thank the panel very much. Appreciate working with, with them and the DDW staff, uh, Jim and I do, to pull this together in, in, in this time frame. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, Randy, I'm going to steal your line from last time. Uh, that was a lot. <clears throat> I also wanted to take this opportunity real quick to... Uh, uh, to give the instructions for public comments very quickly, if I could, one more time, if anybody's jumped on or is listening and has an interest in making a public comment, here are the instructions. It's an email to ddwrecycledwater at waterboards.ca.gov. In the subject line of that email, include the words DPR criteria, expert panel meeting four. And in the body of that email, provide your name, who you represent, whether you're gonna attend by video conference or phone. And for phone commenters, please give us the last three digits of your phone number that you're gonna call from so that we can identify you. Okay, those are the rules for public comment. We're not quite there yet. Um, now I'll turn it to DDW. Uh, Randy, I think uh, you were gonna kind of kick us off from here. Yeah, I am, thanks. And boy, I, I feel like I've made it when Kevin quotes me in the meeting, so. <laughs> So Gene's going to queue up our slides here. 
So I, you know, I just wanted to first start off by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the panel members across all these different time zones we have. And, well, I can't believe it's already meeting number four. So um, I, you know, I just want to thank the panel for giving us time today to talk to the whole panel. Um, and this presentation, just so you know, is based off of the information that we had up until today. So any of the new information, I, I know Adam went over uh, some old stuff from the last couple of meetings, but anything that was new that was presented with those slides, uh, we'll have to go back and review and discuss those before we can make any comments. So this is based off of what we've had up until today. So with that, we can get started. So next slide, please, Jim. All right, this slide is mainly for the non-panel members who are listening in because Everyone on the panel already knows these dates, but uh, a couple of the important dates that we do want to mention are, like uh, Adam brought up, were the March and April milestones for DDW receiving the draft and final consensus memos with the findings if the criteria are adequately protected of public health. So, next slide. Now, regarding those consensus memos, we appreciate the panel's thorough review of all the proposed draft regulations up to date. And we look forward to receiving those findings. It's gonna be an exciting milestone for us. And we know along with the mandated findings, the panel also wants to provide us with a list of recommendations to include with the criteria. So the box that we need to check, and, and Adam alluded to this, but I'm gonna bring it up again, but the, the box that we need to check is whether the expert panel finds these regulations protective of public health. That's our, our key thing. But, you know, I just wanted to state that we are very interested in making um, these regulations the safest and most feasible regulations that we can. So we really appreciate the extra eyes that the panels put on this, taking a look at the, the regs that we've developed. So we will be evaluating all the proposed recommendations to see what we can incorporate into our, our draft regs. Now, Based on some of the panel recommendations for the criteria, we have some preliminary thoughts that we'd just like to share, just you know, real high arching ones for you. Uh, these are the recommendations that we think will improve public health protection. First of all is the requiring of the 24 seven on-site operations for at least the first year. The requiring of the third party peer review for plant designs, commissioning, and the continued improvement for best engineering practices. And then the ozone BAC online nitrate monitoring. Those, we, we feel all those are, are really good and important to improve public health protection. Next slide, please. Then we also found these panel preliminary recommendations useful regarding the additional clarity to the regulations. You know, issues such as uh, address additional topics in the engineering report that Adam went over. This would include the optimization of the upstream wastewater treatment and temperature effects. Uh, other items such as uh, clarify the ozone BAC treatment process recommendations, such as the panel's comments on the order of the treatment, the ozone TOC ratios that we're gonna require and the uh, treatment indicators that we wanna have listed. And then, and then finally with that would be highlighting the importance of things like the life cycle planning and the joint plan. I didn't expect them to get started that soon. Um, well, I think uh, we've got some overspeak there. So, um, so some of the other uh, highlighting of important things would be, like I said, the life cycle planning of the joint plan, cybersecurity, and then also public notification re requirements. So we'll be looking closely at all of those that we just mentioned, and then. Again, we really appreciate the panel's comments and recommendations as we determine what other potential revisions might be appropriate to improve the public health protection and, and improve the clarity of these, these DPR regulations. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? Well, it's to receive your findings in a consensus memo. And if the panel finds that the proposed criteria to be protective of public health, then we can move forward developing the regulatory package. Now, this would include revising the proposed criteria to include all the appropriate panel recommendations, then developing the information required for the regulatory package, which it includes things such as uh, an, an informative diet digest, D 
the initial statement of reasons and then financial impacts. And then going through internal review with the state board, then we bump it up to Cal EPA and then it goes to the governor's office. And, and of course we have to consult with the Department of Finance also. Now we project developing this regulatory package. This will take us um, up through the end of 2022. And once we get sign off on the regulatory package, then we can proceed with the APA or the Administrative Procedures Act rulemaking process, which starts the one year clock to get the regulations adopted. We plan to initiate this APA process early in 2023. Now, the APA process includes a formal public comment process and a public hearing, which, quote, is designed to provide the public with a meaningful opportunity to participate in the adoption of these regulations. So in addition to all this, we'll also be going through the board adoption process at the same time. And the board adoption process is another opportunity for public engagement and comment. I just bring those up so that the public that's listening in knows that there's gonna be multiple opportunities for them to review this and provide us comments on what they think should be included or not included in the regulatory uh, language. Next slide, please. And then here's a timeline that we just talked through to get the DPR regs done by our statutory mandate. I just included this here as a visual reference for later if you'd like to use it. And then the last slide. And then just to wrap up our presentation, this slide is for anyone from the public or any of the stakeholders out there that want more information or have any comments. So you can send them to one of these two locations. But remember, like I was saying, there's still going to be the formal public comment periods coming up as we move through the APA process and the board adoption. So that's that. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin. Great, Randy, thank you very much. We appreciate those, those comments. And I know the panel uh, has been so engaged in this process and excited to uh, not only hear the substantive response, but also to look at that uh, calendar, which is, I think, a really seems like a doable schedule to get this regulation yeah. done on time. So that's congratulations to everybody. It's an important step forward for the state of California. Uh, well done. I appreciate it. So at and, this and point, we appreciate and we appreciate the panel. It's been their help. It, with their help, we've been able to stay on task the way we have. So we really appreciate the panel's work on this. Thank you, Randy. I know there. Uh, yeah, this is a this has been uh, not only informative for us, but we've also had a great time. It's a good, uh, good dynamic group that's kept us on our toes. That's for sure. Okay, Suzanne, uh, I think this is the time uh, that we would move to public comments and I'm informed right now that we only have one public comment. Uh, is there, are there, are there more than one or do we only have the single public comment? We've only received notice of the one public comment so far. It is Jennifer West of Water Reuse California and Jennifer is already logged into the meeting. Okay, so while uh, Jennifer uh, kind of organizes her thoughts for a, a last minute, well, maybe we can pull up that, uh, can we pull up those instructions? Is that possible? So just in case we have anybody out there, Randy did such a good job of uh, going through the process for people who might be out there. I did want to put those instructions up if it's possible. Maybe. Well, Jen, while they're working on that, maybe the time is now for you to make your comment. Okay. and. Yeah. Okay. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Jennifer West. I'm um, the Managing Director of Water Reuse California. I really want to thank the panel for all its work today um, and, um, and the opportunity to comment. So a few things. So we heard from our last, from the last panel meeting and today that the expert panel opined that the DPR treatment train must be in a certain sequence with the, o, with the ozone BAC before the RO to provide effective control of low molecular weight chemicals. So this will probably drive projects somewhat to the alternative clause. So I wanted to have a few comments regarding that, that alternative clause. We very much appreciate the inclusion of the alternative clause as agencies will seek approval um, of pioneering treatment approaches um, that can demonstrate equivalency in achieving water quality objectives. Um, a few comments though, however, the, the alternative clause 
um, we believe needs to apply to all portions of the regulations, not just the chemical control um, as currently written, it, it just applies to the ozone um, BAC chemical control portion. This is similar to how the alternative clause was, was broader for the IPR regulation. So we think that would be a good change to make. Um, we also ask uh, for the regulations, either in the regulations or as part of a statement of reason to provide detail on what criteria DDW would use to assess the equivalency of those alternatives for the ozone BAC. This would really help us as we work on research in this area. Um, also, I think we need to discuss how the alternative clause would be used potentially in the future. It, it hasn't been used before, so there's there's a little unclarity if, um, if, if, if an agency went through the alternative clause and um, a process was permitted under the alternative clause, um, we would hope that use that um, that, that, that the regulations, a process would recognize and incorporate this new process by reference um, and that an agency wouldn't have to prove it again with the same process using the alternative clause again. So um, we're not exactly sure how this would work, but maybe there could be an incorporation by reference um, if, a, if a new process was approved through the alternative clause. Um, so we think more work needs to be done there. Um, and then just a comment on today's comments, we, we, we very much support and hope that DDW will incorporate DPR2 pathogen work. Um, we think there's a strong scientific argument to use the DPR2 data set um, for the DPR criteria. That was its intention. Um, and um, we, we hope that it will be incorporated into your regulatory framework here. With that, um, I wanna thank you very much and um, DDW and the panel. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate your participation all the way through this process. Suzanne, have we got any more notices uh, from anyone of the public uh, wanting to make a comment? We did. We have two more. Andy Salveson of Corillo Engineers, who will be joining us shortly, and also Paul Haberman from UC Davis. So let's just give them a moment to log into the meeting. Okay. Okay, we're gonna to have to put a time constraint on Andy Salveson. So we'll use the three minute rule for him, okay? Maybe. I see Andy has made it in. Yes, I'm in. I'm sorry, I transferred over. Uh, you can hear me, Kevin? No, Andy, we can hear you. Uh, and no, I appreciate you taking the time to come in. Uh, it's 11.42, you've got three minutes, take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate the uh, all the good work that's gone into this. My name is Andy Salveson with Coral Engineers. I just had a, a, it's really a question uh, to, to spur further discussion. It's on the, the recommendations of the nitrification for the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, no argument that that results in better water quality, but it also does come with, uh, you know, substantial energy and capital expenditures and requirements for the entire wastewater plants flow to be handled and treated to that level. So I'm hopeful that there'll be some discussion on the public health benefits that come with that added cost of operating in a fully nitrified mode. Thank you. Andy, appreciate it. Suzanne, I'm looking for the other participant or the other commenter rather, I'm sorry. I am not sure if he has logged in yet. Okay. Let me double check with his email one moment.
maybe. Having been the person on the other side of this, <laughs> trying to make a comment in a public meeting, it's very unnerving. You don't know if you're in doing the right things or the wrong things. Uh, so I really appreciate Jennifer and Andy kind of hanging in there. Uh, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to connect with our third person here. Okay, we'll give them one more minute and then we'll we'll move along. I don't want to hold everybody up. This might be a point where we could ask any of the panelists if they had any uh, comments, burning comments that based on what they've heard, if there was anything else they wanted to emphasize or, or discuss. Um, because I would like to give this person some opportunity to, 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 to get in and be part of the conversation. And the silence is killing me. Kevin, we have a person who uh, sent in some questions that want they want to be read. So okay. I forwarded it to Suzanne. Okay, thank you. Kevin, I'm forwarding these written questions to you. Hmm. Okay. So Adam, I think what I'll do is I'll read these questions uh, and I'll direct them to you as the chair of the panel. And then you can make uh, your own call as to how the either yourself or another panelist should answer. And if so, who, if that's okay with you. Uh, I was gonna suggest give them the DDW. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's okay. Let's put them out there. We can we'll see if we can. Uh, hey, Randy, the read these and take a shot. <laughs> no, I, can, I, can, I can help you. And I think okay. we're we'll doing improv can, now. Yeah. I, I got you. <laughs> All right. Here's question number one. The slides we saw today mentioned Giardia and crypto as base cases. Are there general? Are these generalizable to other pathogens such as COVID? Uh, well. <laughs> no, um, th that's the that's the quick answer. And another part of that is COVID is I, not waterborne, um, so it doesn't seem to it, it doesn't rise up to the concern that that the waterborne pathogens we've been evaluating, including norovirus, rotavirus, adenovirus, and Giardia and Crypto as protozoans, uh, as part of this project, Chuck. Either Chuck or Joan, did you want to comment on that as well? I'll leave it as you said it, Adam. Okay, thanks. Yeah, they're just very different. Also, they're very different classes of organisms. So we know the protozoa produce these oocysts and cysts and different sizes than viruses or nano, bio nano particles. So these things all make them distinct. And uh, often then the reductions by the different processes, treatment processes are not generalizable. Number two, Kevin. Number two, how does a community receiving the treated wastewater in its potable system report illnesses to DPW? What does the community have to show that the illness is related to the recycled water? I think this is probably, I could jump in, but I think it's better if DDW responds directly to that, if they wish. If not, we can, we can take a shot at it. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's something we're going to, 
would make a comment on right now, but we appreciate the comment. We'll take it and make sure it's clear for projects so they know what they need to do for a requirement. Yeah, well, well, on number one though, Randy, DD, I don't think DDW is looking for reporting illnesses no. directly to you guys. No. Um, and it'll just go through the standard state of California health and safety code uh, reporting requirements for reportable illnesses. I, mean, I, I would imagine. <laughs> I don't. I didn't see anything in your criteria to change that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. Nor should it be in there. No. Uh, what does the community have to show the illness is related to? That would be like a is you know some sort of proof you know concept. I, yeah. That I think we'll we'll just hold off on that one. But there's. You know, I, I think it's, <laughs> I, I think it's extremely difficult unless you have a, a major, major outbreak uh, to separate out whether it's related to water or some other exposure route. Chuck, Joan, any other comment on that? Oh, uh, you know, I think it, um, there's been recommendations way back when Anytime we do something new or there's a new chemical in the water or anything like that, that the health department take, um, you know, it, it's the health department's um, uh, responsibility to track disease in the community and to get reports. And so I think that the health department's um, California has a better system than many states in terms of. of trying to keep capture disease in the community, whether it's from food or water or whatever it's from. So any individual that's sick really should get diagnosed and then have that reported up the chain to the, to the health department for sure. Excellent. Okay, let's this go to is, uh, uh, question. Brian Bernadas, uh, I want to take a shot at the COVID question. Because oh, thank you. Please do jump in. Yeah, I think the the question is raised because there's been a lot of publicity how, you know, the COVID virus has been showing up in raw wastewater. So th there's been a number of studies, especially last year, that looked at uh, the treatment that we have for uh, tertiary, not, you, you know, of course, much more with advanced treatment, but the Existing tertiary treatment requirements of filtration and disinfection are uh, adequately effective at reducing COVID, the, the, the SARS-2, you know, virus. So I, I, you know, in fact, Andy Salveson and I have done a number of seminars on that, and uh, the 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 uh, state of California, the State Water Resource Control Board has a statement saying that. We, we, we know that the uh, existing treatment is effective at reducing the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So if that's the question, uh, that's been studied quite a bit over the last year. And uh, I know that Dr. Haas and Dr. Rose have, you know, made statements about that as well. Yeah, Brian, I've got to jump in on that. And I think Gerber probably will as well. So... <clears throat> As far as I know, there are no published papers where the virus has been found in wastewater. Certainly, there's a lot of evidence that RNA, which comes from virus, has been found in wastewater. But finding RNA is, is different than finding the virus itself. Thank you. Yeah, that's great context, Brian. I appreciate that background. They got to make sure that uh, folks have kind of a, the full picture in kind of a layman's terms. I really appreciate that. The third question we'll go to now is that, uh, and I think if the answer here was embedded in one of the other comments, and uh, Adam, the question being hospitals are a source of pathogens and antibiotics and other stuff. Uh, should a hospital wastewater be diverted from the potable reuse stream, or perhaps should hospitals be required to build pre-processing prior to sending their wastewater to treatment? It, it's a good question. It's a source control question. Um, 
rather than me always giving my opinion or my two cents on these, you know, maybe, you know, Joan's good at this one. Chuck is good at it. Amy is good at it from the antibiotic issue. Would any of you like to jump in? Silence. Silence is golden, right? Well, I don't know if it's golden. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Joan. Well, you know, I, I, the ultimately, you know, treating um, wastewater to remove these signals because antibiotic resistance genes are the things that people are concerned with. And because the bacteria themselves were the, the process is geared towards measuring that and removing those, right, to that high log level. And um, so both the bacteria and viruses and protozoa that might come from hospitals, hospital waste. Um, and then there might be increased, I mean, there's been studies, there, there might be increased um, concentrations of antibiotic resistant genes coming out of hospitals but not, I don't think it's been significant. And then the, the goal is to reduce the, that genetic signature as well through the process. And Amy, you may want to add more on the antibiotic resistant genes um, that could be found in hospital wastewater, how different they are from the normal population. Yeah, I think it's a good question and it's an area of interest for research. So there are folks um, in the U.S. and internationally examining this question of whether it's worthwhile to segregate hospital sewage. And so, you know, that might be something in the future, but I think right now in the work that we've done to assess the risk um, associated with water reuse in California, we've, we've used data that's aggregate for uh, typical municipal sewage that includes all sorts of sources. And so I think for the context of what we're looking at, um, it's not it's not something that, that needs to be done, but I think in the future it's worthwhile for um, research as a source control. And, and antibiotic resistance is one specific example where it could be useful. Is, uh... Chuck Gerb, I, I think the exposure possibility is so small, it's insignificant. You have to realize a gram of le a a lettuce can contain 100,000 antibiotic resistant genes. In our studies in kitchen sponges, you can squeeze out thousands per ml of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So they're very common in the environment. Uh, in fact, in our own studies, we found more in uh, wells not contaminated with sewage than those contaminated with sewage. So you have to realize when you look at holistically your exposure, your kitchen is probably your biggest exposure to antibiotic resistant genes you'll ever experience because of the coming in on your food supply. So the amount you would get from water reuse is, is, is even if something managed to survive, it would be insignificant compared to your holistic exposure. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the uh, folks chiming in. Uh, and I think the last question uh, is uh, more of a statement. Uh, at a previous meeting, a consultant indicated that they did not know the status of the Scottsdale DPR project. Uh, and he indicated he had checked and it's been put on hold. I can tell you that I spoke with uh, the chief engineer of the Scottsdale project uh, just last Friday. And uh, it's true that the state of Arizona's effort to produce regulations for DPR is on hold. They don't have sufficient resources to execute the promulgation of those regulations right now. Uh, however, Scottsdale DPR project continues to operate. Uh, it, is, it is a demonstration project though. So uh, tours, I think have been limited for, uh, for a while. So uh, I do know that uh, the project continues to move on and it's kind of exciting. They've got a lot of redundant, they've got redundant UV and some other stuff. I'm gonna go out there and check it out, see if uh, there's something we can learn from it. So Adam, anything you wanted to add? or anyone else wanted to add on the Scottsdale DPR? Uh, no, nothing. Okay, good. Uh, Suzanne, I, are, is that all of the public comments and or questions? That is the end of the public comments that we have. Well, that's exciting. That was the best group of uh, public comments and questions we've had. I, I like that, that give and take, that was good. Uh, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to jump in and participate. And I think as uh, 
Uh, Randy did such a good job of laying out uh, this process is far from over uh, from a regulatory standpoint. They've got a lot of work to do, and this is uh, uh, an important uh, milestone along the way. Uh, we appreciate everyone's uh, work today. I think we've concluded with our agenda. So um, uh, Adam, Jim, unless I, I've missed something, I believe we are ready uh, to conclude this call, but I want to give you an opportunity uh, to make any final comments uh, before we do. No, I'd just like to repeat what we all said earlier. I mean, it was been a, been a pleasure working with the panel and DDW staff and NWRI staff to get to this point. And I know that you know, I'm, I'm pretty much positive that we'll be getting together again over the next, the rest of this year and again in 2023 as, as the staff ask for clarifications on some questions and also possibly ask us to look at their responses to some of our comments and recommendations. Great. Thank you, Randy. I'll give you an opportunity to uh, have any last comments before we sign off today. I, I just want to thank you, uh, give a thank you to the panel for all the hard work they've been doing. It's really, it's, it's really helped us out a lot. You guys have the expertise that, that we needed. So we appreciate, uh, you know, everything you guys are doing to help us out. Great. We appreciate that. Great job, Suzanne. Jing, thank you again for, for running the slides today. And that was an excellent recovery there because that's a lot of pressure. I've been there when the whole group sitting there waiting and you're fumbling over a screen or a thing and you can't figure it out. So well done. I appreciate the effort. Everybody have a great week and we'll talk soon. It's not as bad as dropping an old slide deck. Presentation. <laughs> True that. All right, folks, take care. Bye. Be well.